Alrighty, good morning. Good morning. I'm Donovan Richards, Chair of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises, and this morning we'll be joined by other council members as they make their way uh, down and, and make their way in. Uh, today we have three items on our calendar. We're going to start with a public hearing on land use item number 751, an application for a special permit pursuant to section 13-45 of the zoning resolution to permit an automated parking facility with a maximum of 42 spaces on portions of the ground floor through, through fourth floor of a 25-story mixed-use building. This permit would apply to property located at 100 Varick Street in Councilmember Johnson District. I will now open the public hearing for land use item number 751 and uh, ask the applicants to state their name uh, and who they represent on the record, and then they may begin. Uh, hit your mic, it'll light up. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Council Members. Barack Robel from the firm of Holland and Knight, land use uh, attorney for the applicant. Fernando Alvarez, architect from SLC Architects. Steve Dallasalle, represent the developer. Uh, good morning, council members, ladies and gentlemen. We're here to present the application. Will you mic a little closer? Uh, can you get this up here? Fernando's going to handle the technical aspects of the presentation. Um, right. <laughs> right. So we're here to present an application this morning for a special permit. Uh, to increase the uh, capacity of an as-of-right parking facility, an automated parking facility from 29 spaces to 42 spaces. Um, the facility is located in a building under construction at 100 Varick Street, Varick and Broome. Uh, it's about a 260,000 square foot mixed-use building with 115 uh, condo units and about 17,000 square feet of retail at the ground level. Um, the parking is accessed from Broome Street, which is uh, the northern frontage of the site. It has frontage on Broom, Varick, and Watts. And Fernando's going to show us a picture right now of the access to the garage or the facility. Yeah, can you get that? As you can see here uh, is a rendering from Broom Street. How many units again? 115 units, 115. 29 accessory as of right spaces in connection with the building. Um, there's a two-way curb cut access on the south side of Room Street through a porte cochere. Vehicles will enter into an inner courtyard that's open to the sky. The inner courtyard has some circulation lanes and some reservoir areas that allow for vehicles to access what is a um, transfer cabin. And as vehicles come in through the two-way curb cut, you can leave, the, leave that image up, um, they will circulate here. There's some reservoir spaces here. Enter into a transfer cabin that has a vehicle lift that brings vehicles up to the third and fourth floor volume space of storage. Other vehicles can circle around the space without obstruction. Um, and at present, as we mentioned, there are, about, there are 29 as of right spaces. That, uh, the request is for 13 additional spaces. Uh, it's an automated facility. During the construction of the building, it was found that there were some efficiencies in the space that could accommodate other pallets. Um, and the 42 is for residents only or? All spaces or will be allocated exclusively to the occupants of the building. The reason that the uh, parking is on the third and fourth level as opposed to the ground level or the basement is because there was a desire to have retail continuity at the ground level. And there's a unique situation here where there's a full-size gymnasium in the basement or subgrade here that is actually utilized by the next door nonprofit building, which forced the parking to be up, up mm -hmm. above grade. But it's screened adequately. Uh, matches the rest of the facade of the residential building. And you're anticipating majority of the the retail to be the walkable people walking. Local at, retail. Local retail. Yeah. Uh, go through the type of retail you're looking at. Have you? So not destination retail, just okay. Um, we haven't decided yet. Yeah. So. Okay. There's a, a maximum of 17,000 square feet there, so it's not going to attract a large big box tent. And you mentioned community facility, nonprofit space. Can you go through? Yes, there's a community facility space in the, the cellar that's a full-size gymnasium. Okay. For the school, the door next okay. door. Okay. There will be an, a, a connection between the existing building next door and the new building below grade that will give right. them exclusive access to the gymnasium. will not be used actually by the occupants of the building. It's not an amenity of the building. So you said 115 units 
and 42, so your request for 42 would go specifically for? All the, all the 150, well, all not, not every unit will get one. Right, yeah, okay, got it. Okay, any other questions from my colleagues on this? All right, seeing none, I will now close the uh, public hearing, for, unless there are any members of the public who wish to testify on this issue. All right, we will now close the public hearing on land use item number. Oh, and I would like to acknowledge we've been joined by council members Garodnik, Gradenchik, and Reynoso. So I will now close the public hearing on land use item number 751. Thank you so much for coming in. We will go to a vote now. We are now going to hold a vote on land use item number 751, the Soho Tower Zoning Text Amendment to allow for 42 parking spaces in a new mixed-use development in Councilmember Corey Johnson's district. Do any of the subcommittee members have any statements or comments on this application? All righty, seeing none, I will now call a vote to approve land use item number 751. Council, please call the roll. Uh, Council Member Richards. I vote aye. Garodnik. Aye. Reynoso. I vote aye. Gurdenchik. Aye. By a vote of four in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and zero abstentions, the application is uh, recommended for approval for the re referral to the full land use committee. All righty, I'll hold the vote open in case uh, other individuals get here who would like to vote. We are now going to move on to land use item number 752 and 753, the 670, 1675 Westchester Avenue rezoning application for a zoning text amendment and zoning map amendment. The zoning map amendment would change the existing R6 zoning district to an R8A slash C24 district. The zoning text uh, amendment would apply the mandatory inclusionary housing program. These two approvals would facilitate the development of a 220 unit 13 story mixed use building located at 1675 Westchester Avenue in Councilmember Palmer's district in the Bronx. The residential units would all be affordable to families making 80% less 80% less of the area median income, and 50% of the units would be affordable at 60% or less of the AMI. I will now open the public hearing on land use item number 752 and 753, and I will ask the applicant to state their names for the record and who they're representing today. Hi, my name is David Almonte. I represent the Acacia Network. I'm Director of uh, Development for Acacia. Hi, I'm Michael Wadman from Pips Houses, Vice President of Real Estate. Where's Adam Weinstein? We're missing him this morning. <laughs> He's on a trip celebrating his anniversary. Oh, that's right. He did. <laughs> I, I will start the presentation with um, the first part, and then Michael will finish it off. So. Sorry. Could you give us a sec to try to get the presentation up? <laughs> We're also joined by Chair Greenfield this morning. Uh, did you fill out a slip as yes, well? Yes, I did. You did? Okay. I didn't. Next. 
You ready? All right, you may begin. Okay, the um, the proposed development um, sponsor is a joint venture between uh, the Acacia Network and Phipps Housing, two uh, well-regarded non-for-profit uh, with strong presence in the Bronx. The architect is uh, Datner, another well-regarded, very experienced um, affordable housing developer. Uh, I'm sorry, um, architectural firm. Let's just go with this. Yeah, we'll, we'll go. Yeah. All right, sorry about that. Yep. The uh, property manager is a uh, FIBS affiliate uh, that manages approximately 8,000 units throughout New York City. The proposed site is highlighted in yellow here. Let me move all forward. The ULERP action is a zoning map change from R6 to RAA with a C2-4 commercial overlay. The um, tax amendment will apply mandatory inclusionary housing requirements. And um, the proposed map and tax change would apply to the adjacent property. And we are currently in contract to purchase that adjacent property and will include any FAR um, obtained from that purchase uh, in, into the existing property project. The current and proposed uh, map, um, the post project will be uh, over 200 uh, units uh, of a mid-rise building um, uh, providing affordable housing to extremely low, very low, low and moderate income families. The ground level um, will have over 7,600 square feet of uh, commercial uh, space and approximately 6,800 square feet of co um, community facility. The proposed project will be a passive house project um, if uh, costs permit. We can the property is adjacent or across from the fine fair um, that's uh, um, near, and then you have the um, Westchester elevation right across from, from the site, the post site. Um, okay. So these are just to give you a quick architectural overview. We won't spend too much time on this, but this shows the retail space along Westchester and the community facility uh, as well. Uh, there'll be a landscaped rear yard for use by the residents, which also provides a buffer to the adjacent neighbors. We've added that 25 feet or so of space between the neighbors uh, to try not to encroach upon them too much. This is very easy to read, I know. Uh, typical floor plan, <laughs> but the main point being that, uh, not that you can see it here, but there'll be about 50% two and three bedroom family sized units, uh, as is typical for both of our organization's projects uh, in the Bronx. There'll also be an extensive amenity suite that you see on the lower right there. Uh, exercise room, children's play area, outdoor terrace, uh, computer room, that kind of thing. Uh, these are sample apartment units, pictures from other projects that are similar to what we're gonna do here. And then uh, talk a little bit about the program uh, that we intend to pursue here. So we're looking at both the HPD, HDC, ELLA program as well as the mix and match program. In either of those scenarios, uh, we'll be providing units in the extremely low to low income range, meaning 30, 40, 50, and 60% of median, and the 80% of uh, New York City median. All those uh, affordable bands will be distributed evenly uh, among building types and throughout the buildings. As I mentioned, there's uh, significant amenities, rear yard space, community room, uh, fitness center, et cetera, and most of the apartments are large family-sized units. So. Um, 
under those two programs, uh, we would have a minimum of 30 percent of the units at the 80 percent of median. We've had conversations with the council member about uh, having as many as 40 percent. This slide actually says 50, but at her recommendation, we would limit it to 40 at 80. Uh, and 40 percent uh, units at 80. And yes, okay. correct. Uh, and you see the income ranges there, which I'm sure you're familiar uh, with. We'll also have a band of 30 percent of median extremely low income and a band of formerly homeless as per current city agency guidelines. Cost of the project is about 85 million. Uh, hard costs are about 58 million. Um, we have not finalized the selection of a contractor yet, but have interviewed several candidates. They'll be uh, doing minority and women-owned business hiring as well as local hiring. And uh, FIFS's property management company will provide union scale wages and an affordable health care plan to its workers. Uh, we will also seek to hire locally for those positions as well. And that is uh, basically the run through. That's the picture of the project from across the street where the fine fair is. And we'd be happy to answer any questions or. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony. So let's get into uh, so you're going from an R6, which uh, has no height limits, to an R88. So what are you capping the heights at? So the building should be 12 stories tall. It's going to be 12 stories. And just go through the amount of units again and, and the unit breakdown of ones, twos, and threes in studios. Yeah, so the, uh, the building is estimated at 205 units. This is all not assuming the adjacent site that David mentioned. We are hoping to purchase that site. And what case. would you do on that site more? So the building would, would just be extended along Westchester. It would look, oh, would be extended. It would look the same. It would add something like 40 to 45 apartments. So 45 more units. And is that counted? And, and, and which MIH option are you using? Uh, option 1, which was option So you're going to use option 1. <clears throat> as a result of talking to council staff. And then I also recognize, so you said you're going to do Ella and Mix and Match, so which? So we're One or the other, yeah. Yeah, we're still in final discussions with HPD and the council member on that point. Uh, it's a pretty small difference. It's either 30 percent at 80 or 40 percent at 80. Um, but the 40 percent at 80, as you know, would require Article 11. So mm -hmm. if we pursue that route, we would uh, hope that HPD would present that to you by the time of the vote. Otherwise, it would be the uh, 420C. And what were some of, so I'm assuming, uh, obviously, you went to the community board. Were there any concerns that we should be aware of raised by the community board or the borough president? Uh, yeah, there were a couple of concerns. Uh, at the community board level, um, the, uh, the union scale wages and health care was an important issue. Um, they also asked us to support a few local organizations. Uh, it's probably in your materials, which we have agreed to do. Can you say that again? <coughs> the last. Sorry. They, um, they asked us to support some local organizations like school and uh, police youth group and that kind of thing and park restoration, okay. which we're willing to do. Uh, they also asked us to, to have a discussion with another local group about potentially occupying some of the community facility space. And we'll have that conversation as we proceed. So, um, okay. At the borough president level, the main concern was about apartment sizes. Okay. I think you've heard before. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the revising of the plans that we're doing now, we are intending to increase the sizes from where they are now to accommodate that concern. So can you speak to that a little bit more? To the apartment sizes? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so I think I saw. Okay, there they are. So the, the issue here is uh, HPD's guidelines on sizes were, were made smaller not too long ago. Um, and in the original set of materials that we talked about, we were at the lower end of that size range, which the borough president felt was too tight. The studios. Yeah. So um, <coughs> the studio at 360 square feet, mm -hmm. that would that's the, the lower end of the range. These are all from the original uh, mm -hmm. proposal. One bedroom's at 500, two bedrooms at 670, and three's at 910. So we're planning on increasing these, those all by about 5 or 10% in the revised uh, design to move more towards the middle of the range that, that HPD allows. And let's stay on jobs for a second. So you mentioned you're looking to do uh, union scale wages Remain in health workers, yes. So for can the, you just speak to that a little bit more? What does that mean? Yeah, so um, FIPS has a, a mix of union and non-union maintenance workers at its properties. Uh, quite a few are union, but some are not, uh, with a couple of exceptions which have been uh, raised by 32PJ primarily. Um, and can you go through those exceptions? 
Yeah, um, so we, because it seems to be that we're moving into a history that is a little fuzzy when it comes to, to some of this information. So can you speak to what are you going to do differently opposed to sure. the other yes, projects? I'd, I'd be happy to. So there were uh, three or four properties where we chose to use an outside maintenance company. This was uh, Those properties came online in sort of the 2010 to 2012. And um, though those companies did not end up paying uh, sufficient wages or, or providing an affordable health care benefit. So we were actually in negotiations with 32BJ at, I think it's three of the properties. Uh, the other property were in negotiations with uh, Teamsters uh, 88. And in those cases, we'll, you know, we'll come to agreement. And moving forward, we're not going to use a third party company and we're going to pay at that scale. At our non-union properties, And what other, is your pay scale? Can you just go through what does that package look like? I actually don't have that with me. I'm, I would have to follow up with you. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so uh, basically the idea being that w the workers will choose whatever union or if they don't want to be represented by a union and that we will pay at, at an appropriate scale regardless of whether they choose a union. So I just want to put on the record we look forward to. And are you in conversations with anyone on this particular project now or? Not on this project, no. Okay. This, this far in advance, no, other than making the commitment to pay at that scale. Yeah, so, uh, so I, I'm going to come back to that. Or I'm sure some of my other colleagues will raise uh, more questions as well. Um, can you speak to what does the open space uh, in the project look like? Yeah, so the, um, the primary are the two areas. Uh, one is this uh, uh, terrace that you see in the upper right of this floor plan. Yeah, yeah. So that's uh, basically a roof deck patio area that residents uh, would use. And then down at the ground floor. So say that again. So patio space. Roof terrace. So roof terrace. Right. But no specific open space dedicated right. playground. And then the ground level. Okay. Yeah. So this is the, the landscaping plan for the rear okay. yard area. There would be some uh, children's play equipment as well as hopefully some adult fitness equipment and sitting areas and plantings and that kind of thing. And just go back, uh, back through, so how many units do you anticipate will serve 30% AMI in this project? So it's a total of 20. 10% are the formerly homeless units, right. and 10% are through the HPD lottery. So 20%. Correct. Okay. All right, I'm going to go to Councilmember Reynoso for questions. Uh, I will open the reopen the vote back up for Councilmember Williams to vote on land use item number 751. Councilmember Williams, how do you vote? Vote aye. All right, thank you. Um, hello and welcome this morning. Uh, so um, I know of, uh, of Acacia. I know the work that they do. They work in my district. It's an amazing organization, and I thank you for the work that you do there. I hear I, FIP's reputation precedes itself as a upstanding or, um, organization. So, so I guess my questions would, would lean to, given your history and, and understanding the great work that you've done all this time, why now come to a place where, where you have a, a situation with the workers and the potential pay for the workers and not just iron that out long before you get here so that we can continue our great relationship and, you're, and, and not put yourself in a position where you'll get several questions from council members related to, to basic things like pay um, and union work in, in these developments. I just want to know why, why risk that over, over something that we think is, is is, is practical and makes a lot of sense for your mission and the work that you do. Um, why, why, why put yourself in this position? Well, I mean, I can speak to the situation with the buildings where we have been negotiating with 32BJ for several months. Um, we, I can't speak directly to the negotiations. I'm not part of that group of the company, um, but I know that we've been, we've been trying to get it resolved and it hasn't been resolved yet. Um, in terms of the, the simmering before that, um, I mean, we did many months ago make the decision to not use a third-party company anymore and to, on our Pull future Pull your mic a little closer. Yeah, I'm sorry. And uh, on the future projects to avoid that arrangement, which, as it turns out, really was a mistake. Was there a concern with the, the work prior to hiring uh, the third-party company that would make you even go to a subcontractor instead of continuing the tradition and the work that you've done? As, as FIPS houses in the past? No, it was really a, a decision at the time where, I guess, again, not being directly involved with it, where we, we didn't expect it to work out like it did, obviously. And um, 
you know, it's a decision that we're not going to make again. That's really all. That's right. I, I guess I just want to, what initiated you to make that decision is, I, I guess, where I'm going is, um, was there a problem with the work that was being done before that, uh, that no, made definitely, it? So that, definitely not. So, it was so not then, a quality issue of, so, of existing staff. Right. And, yeah. So from the outside looking in, it seems like, you know, it, it's, a, it's a, <laughs> a bottom line issue, right? It's about money here um, when it comes to, to, to that, that you guys were getting great work. Everything was great. Your reputation was still at the top. You guys were Acacia. You were aligned with Acacia, which is also um, a positive thing. Just continuing to move in, in great place, and then you do subcontracting work. When when your model has worked flawlessly for so long, um, right. um, so so I just I just kind of want to get to where what happened. Are you guys struggling financially? Uh, are you in a position where um, paying good wages was something that you had to overlook um, to to complete your mission? No, no, it definitely wasn't that. And in, and in this case, the the lower pay scale meant more people were hired at the property, but more people at a lower salary. So I, I think the, deci the decision at the time was trying to have a, a more fully staffed building, but without, you know, really thinking through the consequences of the pay scale. So to, to almost to, to finish, just in, in, in my, my, the way I see things, um, a good paying job is better than 10 bad paying jobs. What we're going to end up having is people in homeless shelters, uh, people having to move into um, a lot of the units that you would be providing at, at below 60% AMI instead of being able to have a good middle class job, um, because a good middle class uh, job and wage and eventually be able to contribute to our to our, our tax system and continue to be able to provide you with subsidies so you can continue to do your work. Um, that's what my, our philosophy is, or at least my philosophy is here. And I just, um, I hope this is the last time we have to talk about this um, in, in across the board when it comes to Phipps Houses because um, I know you to be a great organization and I don't want to be on this side having to ask these questions of you. Um, I know the work that you're going to do on the property and the people that you're going to be taking care of is going to be second to none. So let's make sure we do that with the workers as well. Um, it's going to be very hard for me to be supportive of a project where I don't see that you're you're that you're not fulfilling your mission. Um, and I could pull up the Phipps Houses mission right here, and I and I and I'm telling you, it's more aligned with the people that you see standing before you than the work that was happening under the subcontractor before. I agree with that statement completely. Okay, thank you very much. <coughs> Uh, we're going to go to Councilmember Greenfield for questions. Thank you very much. I did actually just want to follow up on something that uh, my colleague, Councilmember Reynoso, said. So I, 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 I guess every project sort of always has a struggle in terms of how you make the numbers work, right? So when you talk about the uh, mission, whether it's Acacia or Phipps Houses, how does that work in terms of your calculation, in, t in terms of trying to decide, okay, on the one hand, we want to create affordable housing, on the other hand, We'd like to provide good jobs for people who live in the community. So do you feel like there's a struggle? I mean, is that really the challenge over here? Because this issue keeps on coming up a lot, and we don't really have a, a clear answer. And honestly, I think it would just be helpful just to sort of know where you folks stand on the issue, right? Is it sort of a philosophy where you're saying, okay, we're doing one in favor of the other, or one is more important or less important? I, I think folks, you know, we, we this is sort of a – I, w I would say this is sort of like Groundhog Day, right? Every time you guys come up here, we sort of hear the same issues, and then we sort of hear, okay, yeah, we're working on it, we're going to work on it, we're getting back to you. So maybe you can enlighten us as to sort of how you figure out that construct. And just sort of give us your honest perspective on is squeezing out a few more units of housing more important than good jobs, or is good jobs equally important or less important? Just try to understand the philosophy, really, that you guys sort of utilize in this uh, process. Uh, hi. Uh, for responding from Acacia's standpoint, we're, again, we're a non-for-profit. We've been in the community, servicing the community for a very long time. And we see both um, as, as equally important. We want to provide um, well-paying jobs in the community. We also want to provide affordable housing. Um, and, and we're fully committed to both. And, and I believe we... We continue to to make that happen as we um, continue to put these projects in you know in in place. Um, you know, I, I believe our colleagues um, at Phipps Housing has have made it clear, and you know that they are committed to to, the, to these uh, two uh, very important 
uh, points and and you know are committing to to provide uh, you know in our partnership committing to provide um, well-paying jobs for the, for this project and ev every other project we develop. Okay, nice to hear from you. How about you, Mr. Phipps? <coughs> yeah, well, as I said, this was a, a handful of projects where a mistake was made in terms of the approach we took. That's that's how I feel about it. I wasn't the person that made that decision, but it clearly, um, moving forward, it's not how we're going to handle it. And in terms of the conversation, you know, continuing, or you hearing about it again, it is the same handful of projects that are still being talked about. It's not that there's a bigger <laughs> problem than we thought there was or anything like that. And we have been in discussions with, with both of the locals that I mentioned, uh, not discussions, formal negotiations. The workers there have uh, have chosen how they want to organize, and we respect that as we do in our other properties. And those negotiations do take some time to finalize. I think that's the only reason that it's not uh, concluded. So I guess, I guess my follow-up question to that is, so when you say that there were a handful of cases, so, and that's no longer the case, so has there been a shift in terms of policy, or is it, are you saying that for some reason it was different then. If so, why was it different? Once again, I'm not. I'm not prejudging over here. It's it's up. It's up to you. We're not in a position to tell you what to do. We certainly can ask what your philosophy is, so that folks have an understanding, right? So, what is your philosophy, and has the philosophy changed? And as it relates to those handful of projects, are you trying to go back and rectify it, or is that situation sort of stuck where it is? I mean, can you maybe expound on sort of what happened in the past, what's happening now, and is do you see sort of any uh, ability of going back and trying to rectify, in your own words, I think you said something like you weren't happy about that situation, right? So what's happening on that just so that we're all informed? Yeah, so um, the handful of properties that I'm talking about are the aberration to the policy. You know, before that point, it had not been our policy to use third-party people, and we had had many, many unionized, but also many non-unionized workers. Um, at that time, we made a choice to have you know, more staff people at a lower cost per staff person, as I mentioned earlier. We were also in the middle of uh, have several projects opening at the same time. But in any case, as I've said, we, we're not doing that again. So it's, it's, those, it's that handful that's the change of policy, and it's one that we now regret and are not going to do again. And in, in our projects moving forward, we will uh, negotiate uh, with unions if the workers choose unions or not, and we won't have that situation with with inappropriately low salaries in healthcare. Okay, so your focus going forward is to make sure that you have the right salaries and benefits, and you're able to balance the two, which is the affordability and the. And it, it, it wasn't well. a balance about being able to build the building. The balance was was the number of staff versus salary per staff. This issue doesn't affect really the capital structure or the initial financing of the project. It's really an ongoing operational uh, issue. Well, I mean, you could always hire more staff at a higher cost, right? So it sort of does interrelate. Within, within limits, yes. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Thanks for the update. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair Greenfield. Uh, can you go through just uh, MWBE procurement as well? So I know in your slide you spoke of MWBE. Yeah. Um, MWBEs. Yeah, Is there a percentage I'm, goal attached to this application? Yeah, I mean, the goal, the goal here is to meet all the guidelines that the city has. So, Those yes. requirements have been. So the HBD. Yes. Yeah, Which is 25 percent. Right. Correct? Right. Uh, I should mention one of the other uh, community board questions was to talk to a specific group on Latino hiring. Uh, we will do that uh, and have our contractor work with them prior to the closing. We haven't moved into that phase of detail yet. Uh, we still have, you know, quite a bit of. And then on local hiring, your work is there a specific organization where your organization oversee that effort, and is there any reporting mechanisms around the local hiring piece as well? Yeah, the um, the general contractors have to report to us, and then we provide that that information to the city. Right, so, uh, I, so I would just recommend that information gets passed on to the local council member yeah, as well problem. on the community board. Not a problem. So if we can have that in writing as well, sure, uh, that would be helpful. Um, and last question, if there are none others from my, no others from my colleagues, uh, just go through the community facility space and also the uh, green features of the project. So I think you, I think I see passive house in here. Right. The, the project is uh, is um, fully um, sustainable, green. Um, 
you know, and we're at the highest level, which is, you know, as, as you know, Passive House. Mm-hmm. So, it's great. yeah, the entire project is going to be at that level. Awesome. And then go to community facility? The, I'm sorry. You um, so on the Metcalf Avenue side, which is not a commercial street, uh, there's about 6,000 or 6,600 square feet. Okay. So he's um, talking about smaller local retail. Well, uh, for the community facility, um, Acacia okay. uh, is going to program okay. part of it. Okay. And then, you know, we'll have, we, we've committed to with the community board um, to provide space uh, to a local group. Okay. Um, you know, if they can afford it, if, um, you know, it's, it, we're, we'll be providing the space at cost. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll have ongoing discussions to provide part of that space. Okay, and I hope it's discounted. Yeah, of course. Okay, yeah, of course. Okay. All righty. All right, I want to thank you for your testimony. Thank Any you. other thank questions you very much. my colleagues? <coughs> um, and I'll just add that, you know, we're going to, you know, as you've seen, many members of this committee are becoming more passionate. We've always been passionate, sure. but even more passionate around job standards. Sure. Uh, so we look forward to hearing a little bit more about that before uh, we come back for a vote on this project. So. Okay, and we'll follow up on the items. All right, great. Yeah. Thank you all for your testimony. Thank you. All right, I'm going to call the next panel, Jose Panero, 32BJ, Marcos Mervillo, 32BJ, David Cohen, 32BJ, Patrick Walsh, 32BJ. you all to uh, state your name for the record and who you're representing, and then you may begin. Uh, and uh, we'll, uh, three minutes on the clock each for each person. Good morning. My name is Jose Pinero, and I'm in a, on a Bronx resident building service worker and a member of 32BJ SEU. My job offers me a living wage and a meaningful benefits, a necessity, necessity for anyone trying to get by in the city. 32 billion members work tirelessly in residential buildings or across the five boroughs. Residential workers here in the Bronx deserve the security that comes with being paid a decent wage with benefits. That is why I am here today to present this subcommittee committee with over 1,100 signatures from all residents of council member Palmas district, opposing pits and the reasoning of 1675 Winchester. The petition reads as follows. In the last decade, Pips House has built new developments across the Bronx. With every building, it has promised to build strong communities, but in recent years, Pips has failed to live up to that promise. Instead, PIPS has created bad jobs in the Bronx, going so far as to work with a contractor that paid employees at PIPS affiliate complexes, poverty wages, and no meaningful benefits. Meanwhile, the salary, salary of PIPS top executives have ballooned. CEO Adam Winston received 760000 in total compensation in 2014, and compensation increased at over 50% over the last decade. While workers at PIV's affiliate complex built under his leadership the struggle to make ends meet, many of them re- resorting to Medicaid to care for their family health. One worker even had to live in a housing shelter with his family for years while working at PIV's affiliate building. This is unacceptable, unacceptable behavior. On the part of the developer that receives significant subsidies from New York City, we urge, we urge Council Member Palma and the City Council to, approve, to oppose PIP's plan 
to build in the Bronx. The Bronx need affordable housing and good jobs. The city should only work with those developers who are committed to creating both. Both could be done. Residents of Councilmember Palmer's district urge the council, the council to vote no on the pro proposed 1675 Western rezoning. Pitt should not be allowed to build and hurt our community the way they have been doing for many, many years. As they testified earlier, they mentioned that in the past, uh, we hear that in the past is a common uh, conversation. And it's important for us to remember that a stop has to, a message has to be sent, that our communities be getting hurt. And uh, it's something that we need to take care of. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Yes, sir. Come on, 32 BJ. You know the trail. <laughs> <laughs> Testimony of Marcos Morillo in opposition to the proposed rezoning of 1675 Westchester Avenue. Fifth House hearing September 25th, 2017. Good morning. My name is Marcos Morillo. I live and work in the Bronx, and I am a member of SEIU 32BJ. 32BJ members maintain clean and provide security service in residential buildings all across the five borough, including one like the proposed development at 1675 Westchester. I am here today opposing the rezoning on 1675 Westchester Avenue. Fifth House is one of the oldest and large developer in the city. As such, FIPS has a significant impact on the standard in our industry and our community. For years, FIPS seemed to recognize this and we consider FIPS a partner in ensuring that working conditions in affordable housing complex met the industry standard. However, on the day current leadership this no longer seem to be the case. Workers at FIPS, two most prominent recent development, have struggled to get by with poverty wage and no meaningful benefits. Some have relied on Medicaid for her care and one live in a shelter for years while working at the building. This isn't right. FIPS project get millions of dollars in subsidy from the government. Their CEO received over 800000 in 2015 in total compensation. If the government subsidy taxpayer dollars that FIPS get are enough to cover this kind of compensation for the CEO, they should be enough for FIPS to ensure that workers at their building are treated right. Furthermore, FIPS continue to employ American maintenance and irresponsible contractor at their Via Verde complex. Here, workers report poverty wage and prohibitively expensive health insurance offerings. With the offer, Plan residential workers will have to pay 916 a month, half of their income for, for, family, for family coverage. The workers are not aware of any retirement pension offering. The fact that FIPS allows such condition in such high profile recent building is indicative of what we can expect in future building. 32BJ members know how important it is that we build affordable housing in our city, but it's not helpful if the job at this building extends to add to the homeless crisis instead of helping to solve it. The zoning and franchise subcommittee 
has the power to cocktail thieves in part in our city. We ask you to vote no on the upcoming UR, URP. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Patrick Walsh. I am a New York City resident and a proud member of SCIU 32BJ. I just want to echo the earlier testimonies. I've been able to stay in the city with my family because the owner of the building I work in is responsible enough to ensure that the staff is paid different wages and benefits. Phipps Houses is a well-known name in the city, serving as one of the city's oldest and largest developments and creates city-subsidized affordable housing. But recently, they've been building a lot of housing and creating poverty jobs alongside of it. We are here to say that this isn't okay. If you want to build here, you need to commit to creating good jobs. It's not okay for workers in affordable housing complexes to struggle to find their own shelter. It's not okay for workers in a development that, that was built with tax paper, taxpayer subsides to rely on Medicaid to get health insurance. It's especially not okay when Phillips' own CEO is getting rich, earning over $800,000 a year in 2015 in total compensation. Phibs can't afford to make sure workers in these developments earn a decent wage. Phibs can and should do better for the Bronx. We don't want to be calling for their projects not to move forward. We believe in more available housing needs to get built, but we don't have to do it this way. Phillips can't be allowed to undermine the good job standards that building workers have spent years fighting for. It's not okay to promote poverty wages when workers deserve the area standard wage and meaningful benefits. We ask the council vote no on Phipps' proposal to rezone 1675 Westchester. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Members. Um, I'll be brief. I'm reading testimony on behalf of Kyle Bragg, uh, our Secretary Treasurer. So I'm going to read in the first person for Kyle. Um, good morning. My name is Kyle Bragg, I'm Secretary Treasurer for SEIU 32BJ. And you've heard from our members about the standards in the industry we fought for. You've heard about our th over 1,000 signatures from Council Member Palma's district that this isn't uh, the, way, the way development should be done in the Bronx without a commitment to good jobs. And I also want to read briefly from a letter we have from a community organization, the Banana Kelly Community Improvement Association. And in this letter, um, the Banana Kelly President, Harold Dorenzio, explains the underlying principles of their organization. He says, with regard to living wages of all our employees who are paid a, a minimum of $15 an hour and the ratio of highest to lowest paid for full-time employment is roughly three to one. Our service employees are members of 32BJ. We are proud to be affiliated with your union, which does so much to ensure that all of its members have access to quality training, um, which includes safety training, earned salaries and benefits that allow their families to grow and prosper within our communities. The principles underlying our practices as outlined here are basic to the mission as we believe they should be for all who work within our sector. So again, we support and admire developers like Banana Kelly and affordable housing developers specifically who are committed to good jobs. And until um, Phipps makes that same commitment, we ask the council to vote no on this rezoning. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, David, for your testimony. And uh, our, can you speak to our, sure. any current conversations going on between Phipps and BJ? So the conversations which were mentioned um, and they're, uh, ar around a previous site, around the Cortland Corner site, there is bargaining that is happening there, but progress has not been made around the worker standard issues that we're fighting for, including some key, you know, key benefits, um, which would really encourage FIPS and I, um, to, to make those commitments as soon as possible. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. All right, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify on this issue? All right, seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on land use item number 752 and 753. Our last hearing will be on the 135-0135th Avenue rezoning, which includes a pre-considered text amendment application and a pre-considered zoning map amendment. The zoning map amendment would change the existing M1-1 zoning district to an R7A district, and the zoning text amendment would apply the mandatory inclusionary housing program. 
These two approvals would facilitate the development of a nine-story residential building located at 135-0135th Avenue in Queens in Councilmember Cool's district. Under the MIH option, at least 30% of the floor area of the building will be affordable to families making an average of 80% of the AMI. I will now open a public hearing on these two pre-considered applications and go to Councilmember Cool if he wishes to give uh, any remarks before we begin the hearing. I want to give any Uh, thank you, Chair Richards, and thank you, my colleagues in this committee. Uh, I am in general supporting of this uh, uh, um, upzoning and MIH application, so uh, I'm welcome to other inputs from the from Fashion Town Hall and other uh, like community board members. You know, but in general, I'm supporting this. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Thank right. you, Councilman Koo. Good morning, everybody. Happy New Year to those that are celebrating and hope those that aren't had a couple of days of a little bit more quiet while those that were were out. Uh, we're here today for a great rezoning. To my left is Raymond Chan. He's the project architect. Uh, and to my right is Timothy Henze uh, with Henze Affordability Consultants. He did uh, the MIH-related analysis on the project. And we're all here today to present to you a rezoning uh, for a, uh, the block frontage on 35th Avenue in Flushing, Queens, between Farrington and Linden in Councilman Koo's district. We'd like to thank Councilman Koo. He's been involved in this rezoning since the idea was conceived about three years ago, and he's worked with everybody very diligently the entire way through and has, as usual, been a very good communicator, bringing people to the table, and we thank you for that. Uh, this is an overview for the council people that are council persons that are here today. I gave you a package just now which has support from the property next door to us, uh, which is operated by Flushing Town Hall. It's a vacant lot. Uh, it's uh, owned by DCAS or the City of New York, and Flushing Town Hall owns that. They are one of the properties within the rezoning, and they support it. Uh, I've also given you uh, the community board recommendation for the application, as well as Councilman Koo's letter of support for the application. So that way you have a good feeling for what's going on with our neighbors, as well as the community board, as well as the council person. Uh, the one thing you should be aware of with this rezoning, the, the, the twist in it, is uh, it's on a block front. If you're not familiar and you haven't been down 35th Avenue recently in Flushing, Queens, if I could just point here, I'll, well, Tim, my Anna White is holding the boards, uh, and I didn't get the memo on the technology, but I'm kind of glad I didn't get the memo because the technology really doesn't work so well. Uh, that, and that's everywhere. That's not just here. Uh, the yeah, don't, property, offend, don't offend the city council. We yeah, I don't offend. No, they did a great job. No, yeah. no, it's everywhere. We have the best IT team. The best in the world. IT division I've ever seen. It's just technology sometimes gets in the way. Paper sometimes works best. Uh, the rezoning areas here. What I'm pointing to, you could see, it's an M11 zoning district right now. The uh, M11 zoning district is really a vestige from years and years ago where this portion behind Northern Boulevard was more of a commercial and manufacturing zone. As the years have gone by, in the past 20 years in particular, 35th Avenue has taken on an intense residential uh, feel to it. There's been a flurry of development activity that I'm going to point to in a second in pictures and Councilman Koo is familiar with, uh, where the Zoo Brothers, who are very well-known developers in the city, are doing a 260-foot tall uh, mixed-use developments on this lot right here. We're asking for an R7A on this property that would facilitate the development of a nine-story residential devel development that have approximately 93,000 square feet of floor area, 72,000 square feet of floor, excuse me, 93 units. Of those units, 27 of them will be affordable, 66 will be market rate. Uh, we're proposing under option three the 80 percent uh, of AMI option in the affordability matrix. If I could just go back to the character for a second to give you a flavor for what you are being asked to act on. This is the property right here. There's an existing one-story building on it. The one-story building is carved up into a series of smaller businesses, paint shop, uh, cafe, uh, there's a nail supply shop around the corner. They're basically uh, use group six retail and some use group 16 contractors establishments. They employ about 10 people. Everybody here has been informed of what's happening. Uh, and they're being given plenty of time there to, to vacate. They're not being given the chance to relocate because of what I'm about to talk about with Councilman Koo. Uh, if you can come back to the zoning map, one, go back one more time if you can. Uh, the twist in this rezoning was that as we were going through the community board, uh, you see here we're asking for a pure R7A rezoning with no commercial overlay, yet there's commercial overlays that 
are around us on this side, none over here, uh, but there's some non-conforming commercial uses over here as well. Community Board 7 had asked us to remove the commercial overlay during the Community Board process. Uh, we didn't necessarily agree with them at first. We resisted. Uh, but Chuck Apelian, who's the land use chair, has very strong convincing natures. And uh, he convinced us to remove it. Councilman Koo agreed to it. Uh, and we've agreed as well. So the proposal that you see before you, if you're wondering why it doesn't have a commercial overlay on it, that's the backstory as to that. And that's also laid out in the communications you have from Community Board 7 as well as from Councilman Koo's office. Uh, that's so did you, out of that, you said you won't be able to relocate Current because of that, yeah, the here. current commercial uses are not going to be on the property. It's going to be a fully residential building uh, when it's developed. And then I'll stop talking because I know I'm, um, I talk a little bit. I'll go to one more picture that could help you. Just keep going down, Tim, to the, uh, this is an aerial somewhere. Here it is. Uh, picture's worth a thousand words. So just so you can have some comfort that what we're asking you to do is within context of the area. I mentioned a few moments ago, this is, that's 35th Avenue right there. 35th Avenue, as I mentioned a few moments ago, has undergone a complete transformation within the past 10 years. Uh, these two sites are the Zoo Brothers sites that I'm talking about. They're in an R6 zoning district. They were historically old, defunct gas stations that have sat around since the 50s. Uh, now they're going to be 147-foot tall and 160-foot tall, mixed-use, residential, hotel, commercial. What we're asking for on our property is going to be 95 feet tall. So the R7A that we're asking for will produce an, a 95-foot tall building, yet we are surrounded, as you can see, from existing developments up top that are well within the range of what we're asking for, uh, but particularly the two zoo sites are uh, going to be gigantic buildings. So how we far feel is Flushing Bay? How far is Flushing Bay? Uh, I'd say you're going this direction, you're about a little under a mile, maybe a little okay. over a mile. You're, you're pretty good distance from Flushing Bay. But the creek is uh, over there. Flushing Creek is about five blocks in this way. So that's it. I'd be happy to go into more. I talked a lot. If anybody wants any more information, All Raymond right. Chan and is MIH here. And why did you go with uh, option three? Uh, Tim Henzi is here. He could talk about it as well. Uh, option three was chosen after much debate and discussion with Community Board 7. That was their desired uh, MIH option. Uh, so we agreed, obviously, with what they agreed, and uh, the councilman has been presented with that. And I okay. assume I haven't spoken to him specifically about their choice with the MIH, but I presume I haven't heard anything to the contrary. I assume he's on board with that as well. And you're not using any subsidy? No subsidies, no subsidies at all. Hopefully, okay. uh, we will be hopefully applying for a 421 or the former 421. Uh, <laughs> nobody knows what to call it. All right. But. Nice. You want to speak, Tim? Would you like to say anything? Not unless there's questions. <laughs> okay. And what role is uh, Flushing Town Hall playing here? Flushing Town Hall is simply a neighbor. They own the property. Uh, if you look up here, you see this property I'm pointing to that has all okay. the trucks on it. Uh, that actually looks much better now. That's an old aerial. Uh, the city has rebuilt that site and made a beautiful parking lot. Uh, as far as parking lots could be beautiful. Uh, so they, Flushing Town Hall, operates that parking lot for the accessory use for their facility, which is on Northern Boulevard. And it will continue to? Or? Yes, they will continue Okay, they to. will continue to. Yes. And then uh, just go down through the breakdown of the uh, units. Sure. Unit, uh, sort of ones, two. The sizes three, and things like that. Uh, okay. Sure, I'll start with the affordable units. Uh, and also, uh, the, uh, by the way, in the handouts I gave you, there's also okay, a little see. summary fact sheet okay. of things, too, that gives you some more information if you want to pick through that. Uh, the affordable units, as I spoke of a moment ago, there's a total of 27 uh, of those. Five are studios, nine are one bedrooms, uh, 12 are two bedrooms, and there's one three bedroom. This is the affordable component. This is the affordable right? component. Okay, so the majority of the affordable component that is nice okay. really uh, one bedrooms and two bedrooms. We've got 21 uh, units of those. Uh, the market rate has 66 units within it. Uh, the majority of those, again, are one and two bedrooms, 23 one bedrooms, 28 two bedrooms, 12 studios, and three three bedrooms. Uh, the rents, going back to the affordability uh, range anywhere, I believe. I don't have it right in front of me right now, but it's, uh, I'll let Tim speak to that, actually. So we've and, and the units will be spread, spread throughout, throughout the building. The building. Yeah. So if you're in an affordable unit, you can get a nice view at the top as well, yes. right? Okay. Correct. All right. The, the affordable units are in proportion to the, the, all the unit sizes and spread out evenly, as you, as you mentioned. Uh, we're average at 80%, so we have units that's from 60 to 100% AMI to get to the 80% average, uh, six, nine units at 60%, nine units at 80, and nine units at 100% AMI. 
And I'm assuming parking is an issue in Flushing. What are you? What are we? Oh yes, yeah, I didn't just discuss parking. Just we're so well. We're so. <laughs> I'm well going to go parked. to Councilman Baku. I'm yeah, I'm sure, has a lot we, more to we, say we, on these. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I just remember. I think we might have done a walking tour over here. I think when I first became. Yeah, no, Flushing here. is notorious. You so, can't get through Community Board Seven with Chuck Apelian without yeah. more. Every parking. time I go to Peter Ku's office, I have to park in the garage. Yes. Well, yeah. You spend baby money. Yes. Yes. You're okay. spending. Well, you can go to the municipal <laughs> lot too. You can deal with the municipal lot. If you could get luck in parking in that municipal. <laughs> you got to you got to circle around yeah. uh, a few times. But th to answer your question, uh, we're we're overparked. We're proposing 52 parking spaces. Okay. Awesome. Uh, 37 spaces are required, and the 52 are on. If you when you if you had free time, you want to review the plans. Uh, it's well spaced. They're not crammed in there. There's okay. two levels. Awesome. It's self park. It's not mm -hmm. valet, which means that enough space over amount of space has been given. Okay. Uh, so we're very well parked. There's a lot of parking. Raymond Chan, uh, who has not spoken, obviously, is uh, is a Flushing architect, very well versed oh, in awesome. the parking needs of Flushing. All righty, so he knows the needs. Smart man. Absolutely. All right, I'm going to go to uh, Council Member Koo. Actually, I have no more questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. All right, Pete, I took all your questions. Forgot you were here for a second. I apologize. Don't hold it against me. All right. Are there any? Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you very much. Uh, Chair thank Greenfield, you. no questions? Did I take all your questions, too? Okay. We all are happy? Okay. Everybody's happy. All righty. Are there any other members of the public who wish to testify on this issue as I find my testimony somewhere? Okay. Seeing none, we will now close out uh, public hearing land use item number 751, the Soho Tower Zoning Text Amendment. So, oh, I'm wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Give me one second. All righty, let's go back. <laughs> All righty, here we go. All righty. Are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? Seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on the 135-0135th Avenue uh, rezoning. And we will now, okay, this concludes our hearing today. Look at that. We are going to lay over uh, all the other items for the next meeting. Thanks to the land use staff for all of their work on these applications. They are so awesome. We have the most outstanding land use staff in the city of New York here. Uh, and with that being said, this meeting is now adjourned.